Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 16th, August 16th, August 13th. I guess I'm ahead of my time. Uh, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but uh, this week I mean it. I need to get a little jacked up. Oh, it's a Mountain Dew. We have so much to cover. Unfortunately, I, I keep forgetting to go to the store or um, request to my wife to go to the store. So uh, we'll just have to make do without it this week. And I think uh, I'm pretty excited about everything. I think we should be able to get it all in. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. It's easier for me to just sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future. Yeah, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, I want to talk about setup plus sector plus market plus waiting for entries. I'm getting quite a few questions on the setup in comparison to the market, in comparison to the sector. And then, of course, it's very important to always wait for entries. This morning, um, got some emails or a, an email, I should say, about the death cross and how the uh, media is talking about that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, rusty bow ties. We've got some bow ties working at a rusty, so we'll talk about that. Tom Petty market, and that'll make a lot more sense in just a minute or two. Um, be happy to talk about anything or give you my thoughts on anything that uh, you want me to talk about. So start thinking about that now. And uh, I do take user requests, obviously. So um, if we want to talk about a stock, uh, wait until we get to the charts first, so we don't get so uh, we don't get your stock picks mixed up with everybody's questions. And uh, number two, once we do get to the charts and open up for stocks, ask about a stock and then hit enter, and then you can ask about other stocks too. But uh, otherwise, I'll just pick one from your list, and I won't be able to remember which ones you um, you asked about. So you can ask about as many as you want. Just hit return after each one. All right, enough of that housekeeping. Let's talk about the death cross. Well, I don't uh, pay much attention to the news or watch much TV, uh, or at least market-related TV. So I'm not. Sh I didn't know that the media was talking about the death cross. The death cross is when you have the 50-day moving average crossing over the 200-day moving average, and you can see we now have a negative slope in the 50-day moving average, and the 200-day moving average has come up to meet it. By the way, I don't know exactly where 200 days is, but with a moving average, there's what's called the so-called drop-off effect. If you're adding in higher prices and you're taking off lower prices, then that moving average is going to tend to start to catch up with price. And that's what we have going on now. And that happens especially when the market begins to flatten out with a long, long-term moving average like 200-day moving average. So that's has helped the 200 to come back up to the market. Also, by the way, uh, notice that a 200-day moving average, or any moving average for that matter, will often correspond with uh, support or resistance. So obviously, shorter-term moving average, short-term support and resistance. But notice that uh, right here, it became a support zone, and then those lows are also a support. So a lot of technicals come together around the same point in a lot of ways. So sometimes people have one favorite indicator over the other. And if you boil it all down, a lot of times they're all the same. And years ago, there was somebody who just took a, a formula, inverted it, put their name on it, and, and they got a lot of credit for that formula. And all it did was invert it. <laughs> so um, whatever. Anyway, before I digress, I guess I'm just jealous because I didn't put my name on anything. I just I named things, cute little names, and forget to put my name on them. Um, although my wife keeps telling me to do that. Anyway, long story, and let's, let's just, or before I digress too far, I should say, let's get back to the death cross. Well, you can see this 50-day moving average is beginning to roll over in here, and this 200-day moving average is coming up. So if they do cross over, it's the so-called death cross, and that's the name given to it. So it sounds a little ominous, but what does it mean, or does it mean anything? Well, it's not a positive development. Anytime you have some sort of trend following technique that begins to trigger a signal, then obviously it's not a positive. Oh, by the way, too, be super careful if you're if you are using something like this, there's gonna be a tremendous amount of lag in it. Not so much when the market goes sideways like this. It could actually be quote unquote the top and it could be uh, an important signal to watch. But Keep in mind that if the market is a sharp sell-off, 
you need to just be stopped out and not sit around and wait for a moving average across. Because by the time that moving average gets around the crossing, especially on the downside, the uh, the downtrend could actually be over. But anyway, before I digress too far, let's take a look at what happened the last time the market had two death crosses. Oh, my gosh. Well, in 2010, we had one, and not a whole lot happened. And in 2011, we had one, and not a whole lot happened. Okay, so don't get too caught up in the hype or the excitement of it, but do pay attention to it as an indicator that the trend may be turning or the trend may be coming to an end if we get one. Okay, but don't sit around and wait for one. If the market starts dropping like a stone, obviously allow yourself to stop out of your positions and be super duper selective on new positions or the upside, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about in just a few minutes. Um, if you go back a few weeks or I forget how long ago it was, it's everything's kind of a blur now. I've been so busy, but I wrote a column and I called it the Blue Bonnet of Markets. And Blue Bonnet, for those of you who are not familiar with Blue Bonnet or not from the States, uh, Blue Bonnet is a... I guess it's a margarine. It's been around for a long time, and they're, um, they say everything tastes better with blue bonnet on it. Well, everything works better with trend. It's kind of what I call the, the blue bonnet when it comes to the markets. So you can see this is just a 200-day moving average, nothing special or magical about that. But what's kind of cool is daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. You could... You could see light in between the lows and the moving average. And one way you could do this is just draw a line in between the two and see if uh, where it gets intersected. It did have a little bit of daylight there. And then for the most part, we've had the moving average above, I'm sorry, the lows above the moving average for a long, long time. We had a little kiss recently, and we just kissed it a couple days ago, in fact. But you can see that once a market gets trending, then everything works better with trend. And something as simple as following the daylight, as I wrote in a proactive article a while back, and I'm due to write another one. I might continue on that theme. But just following something as simple as daylight can help to keep you on the right side of the trend. I don't want you to rush out and trade that, okay? But keep in mind something simple like that again, not to beat to that horse, could keep you on the right side of the trend. It's amazing how many people are calling tops and saying it's the end of the world, and they've been doing that for a long, long time. Well, just never forget to look at the markets. And the other thing that I say quite often is I'll see people in some of these presentations um, in person where I, that I'll attend where they'll have just hundreds or dozens, if not hundreds, I should say, of buy and sell signals. And the chart will actually be a little cleaner than this. It'll kind of look like look like that. They'll have like 100 buy or sell signals. And I'm like, and sometimes they'll have a moving average in there. I'm like, well, why you just, don't you just stay long as long as you're above the moving average? And the caveat to that is once you've established that trend. So instead of making 100 trades in and out like a madman, just once you get on the right side of the trend, stick with the trend. So the point is everything does work better with trend. Good morning, Dave. I'm not getting your email to get in the rub. Have you checked spam? I go to your website, and once it starts, I register, and I don't get an email to get in or don't get it at all. Um, well, registration is, is a two-step process, and I guess I could send out that new link. I'm just trying to cut out, cut down on the amount of emails I sent, down, sent out. But uh, I'll, I'll definitely start sending out the, the link before the show uh, for next week. So anyway, the point here is that everything works better with trend. Now, let's – um. Let's take a step back and talk about what's going on in the market. Obviously, and if we go back a couple slides here, you can see that just let's just take 2015, keep life easy, okay? So in 2015, what has the market done? Not a whole lot, okay? Kind of a Janet Jackson market. What is the market? What have you done for me lately, right? So when it's going sideways like this, and I'm going to probably beat the dead horse on the sideways action 
in just a few minutes here. But when it is going sideways like this, you definitely want to be very patient. And I did a, a column a couple days ago where I listed like 10 rules. And at the same time, I noticed that my friend Greg Morris with uh, his blog, Dance with the Trend, which is uh, right here if you want to check that out. You always get something good out of Greg. These um, He'll get mad at me if you call him an old timer, but he is. He's retired now, so I can call him that. He's been around forever. And um, anyway, that's his blog. And he put in some uh, rules, and, and it, within those rules, there were some really good quotes. And ironically, it was the same day that I published some rules. Uh, I think it was uh, day before yesterday. Anyway, um, willingness and ability to hold funds in cash while awaiting real opportunities is a key to success in the battle for investment survival. And that's George Leob. So... He's saying that sometimes you just have to sit, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. And by the way, it's kind of ironic. I think I wrote in the call of yesterday that you would think that in trading, the longer you're at it, the more active you would be. But at least for me, it's been just the opposite. And for most people that I know that have been in the business for a long, long time, you become a little bit more skeptical of the markets. You you become a little bit more like you're from Missouri and you say, show me. And you want to see that the market is going to follow through, that the market is trending, that you are picking the best stocks that the sectors are also confirming, and I'm going to get into all that in just a few minutes, so just hang in there for a second. So, again, it seems like the longer I'm in the business, the less and less I'm trading. I mean, I was kind of in and out of the markets quite a bit early on, and even when I was doing some position trading for some money that I was running, I was still in and out all day doing day trades and I was trying to figure out if I could do maybe a little short term trades in between and try to squeeze off a little bit here or there. And it just, especially like in the, uh, in the late nineties when we had the rip roar bull market, it was hard not to squeeze off some day trades here and there and all, but, but now, and not just because conditions have changed, but I've gotten a little bit older and a little bit wiser and realize you're going to kill yourself trying to be in and out, in and out, in and out over and over again, which, kind of dovetails into this lever war quote down here. But anyway, uh, be patient away from the fat pitch. I'm not a huge uh, sports fan, although I will occasionally uh, go to a Saints game and watch the Saints, obviously, because I'm from New Orleans, uh, thereabouts. But I'm not a huge sports fan. But my understanding of a fat pitch is that it's when the ball is thrown and – it's a hittable ball. The professional baseball players say it looks like a like a cabbage ball or something. A cabbage ball is a much bigger ball, bigger than a softball. It's just a huge ball. And I think cabbage ball, you don't even use a glove. It's like a a, a game of baseball without even a, a big glove. But it looks it looks huge, and that that's why it's the so called fat pitch. And my understanding is. You swing at the fat pitch, meaning it's a hittable ball. You should swing at these hittable balls. Not that you're necessarily going to hit them, but your odds are much better. And on the flip side of that, what you're doing by doing that is you're eliminating the the bad pitches. So coming back to like the trading analogies, I remember early in my career – when I was doing a lot, a lot, a lot of this mechanical testing, at one point it just hit me like, oh, okay. All I have to do is filter out the bad trades and all I'm left with is good trades. And I think at that point in time, I was thinking all I had to do was filter out all of the bad trades. Well, unfortunately, you're not going to filter out all of the bad trades because that would be a holy grail hunt. You'd only be left with the winners. But you want to filter out as many as possible. So you only want to take that trade when everything is in your favor, when it's the so-called fat pitch. And I did a little Googling this morning, 
And it looks like that that term is really beat to death when it comes to an investment uh, world. But I think it just makes for a really good um, analogy. Now, my favorite is always going to be from Livermore. And you always get something good out of Livermore. And I've got my old copies of uh, Reminiscence of a Stop Operator. There it is right there. It's 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 beat to heck. Uh, it's folded, uh, torn, and dog-eared, and highlighted, and underlined. That's a pretty bad shape. Um, I got me a Kindle one, so uh, <laughs> uh, I could still read it. But anyway, uh, Livermore said, it was never my thinking that made the big money. For me, it was always my sitting. Now, this, as I've said, uh, it's Gerald. Okay, I don't know where I got George from. Gerald M. Leo. Okay, thank you, Leon. So this is supposed to be Gerald. G-E-R-A-L-D. Thank you. We'll take that out. We'll edit that out. So this has been misconstrued as sitting on a winning position, which is vitally important. And that's why every time we have a stock that goes days, weeks, and even sometimes months without a whole lot of action that we're already in, and then it takes off, that's why I do the dead money report and say, okay, sometimes you have to – sit tight. And I think that's another Livermore quote, uh, be right and sit tight. But anyway, this particular quote here, this specific quote here has been misconstrued to mean that he's talking about sticking with the position um, and, and letting it work, which is important, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about waiting for that fat, that so-called fat pitch and waiting for when conditions are conducive to your methodology. And I was uh, searching for Livermore quotes, and then I realized, uh, geez, I write about him so often in my column. So I just did a search in my uh, search box on my website, and, and this is what I came up with. And I wrote about this not too long ago. I let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment. Looks like I spelled judgment wrong. The desire for constant action, irrespective of Underlying, is that right? Underlying conditions is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even amongst among professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. So we are under a lot of pressure to make money. Whether you're a private trader, you want to make money as fast as possible. You want to get some money coming in. Or if you're a fund manager, you're under some pressure to uh, to make money because the clients or want to put that money to work. They don't want that so-called dead money out there. So you're under pressure. And then on the retail side of my business, I'm under pressure with my trading service because people want setups. People crave action. But a lot of times, there's nothing to do. And if I'm not going to do anything, why should I produce some sort of product? As Peter Bothy once said, and I wrote this in my last column, I think, don't invent trades. And I don't want to digress too far, but you've got to realize that different people come every week and there's some new people here. But one of my favorite things that happened to me uh, a few years back was I was asked to be on this institutional project. And we were going to uh, recommend trades for this this project. And it seemed like a recipe for disaster, but it actually worked out incredibly well. We had an options guy. We had Larry Millen. He was our options guy. And we had B uh, for stocks for the sweet to intermediate term. And we had some other people in there, commodities and such. And you would think that you put all these guys together and it would be a recipe for disaster. But it actually worked out really well and but going into the project i said peter uh, it was peter bothy who asked me to, to to join him i said peter i don't know if i'm the guy for you i said there might be weeks and sometimes even months where there's not a whole lot you're going to get from me if you're looking for somebody to contribute every day or every week i'm not your guy and he came back with something that i've never forgotten he said you're exactly my guy you're exactly the guy we want for this, and I'll tell you why. You should not invent trades. So he said, don't invent 
trades. And that made a lot of sense to me. And I've, I've never forgotten that. So you don't want to try to make something happen when there's nothing going on. Now, I can't find this exact quote on this. If somebody can find it and email it to me, that'd be awesome. In fact, I, I couldn't find a – it's not in my Kindle version, so I, I just found um, my old beat-up version of Reminiscence, and I have like a um, – what do you call it? I have one from the early 60s also that I'm not – I don't want to dig through it too much. I want to save that one for uh, collective purposes. But if somebody can find the, the exact quotes – uh, or this, let me know. So I just kind of took it from my head. Those traders that feel that they must be in and out every day are laying the groundwork for your next venture. And that's a paraphrase. And if you really think about what that means, okay, and this is, this is in less than ideal conditions, by the way. Let me phrase this within less than ideal conditions, meaning that as a trend follower, if the market is doing this, there's no trend to follow and you don't want to be in there. But the good news is those people that are buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling, okay, while the market is doing this, they're making that base, okay? And when we get to the actual markets, I'll, I'll reiterate this point here. Loeb, pronounced Loeb, what did I say, Leob? Well, you guys are, I'm, <laughs> good thing I have you guys. We should probably do a warm-up show, uh, a rehearsal. <laughs> okay, it's Loeb, Loeb. Uh, anyway, so all these traders back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, kind of fighting it out, right? Let them fight it out. Well, what happens is this could form a base or does form a base, especially if they tend to cancel each other out. So two things can then happen. If the market begins to take off, this will become a value zone. Remember that support becomes resistance and resistance becomes support once broken. So the market will come back and this will – be perceived as a value zone. People want to buy stocks again. And that'll help make the market or help the market to move higher. So that's kind of an interesting thing about the base. On the downside, and remember, we're not afraid to short. It's not my favorite thing to do. I try to avoid it, okay? But every now and then you'll see me squeeze one off. And if we start selling off fairly hard here, we start following through to the downside. You're going to see more and more shorts out of me and probably not any longs unless something like gold or oil or whatever bottoms out and we begin to see some setups in those particular stocks. But if the market does break down, then anyone who bought in this zone is going to be looking to get out of break even. So this is going to kind of serve as a cap for the markets. Now, it's not as cut and dry as saying, okay, well, you got to rage, you break out. You're good. You break down. You're good because this is going to be the support or resistance, whatever the case may be. But the longer you stay above it or the longer you stay below it and the further you get above it and the further you get below it, the more important that rage becomes. Yes, mostly in cash and when it sets up, pounce hard. Amen. You know, uh, I used to not like it when I was in cash because I felt that dead money – uh, mentality, but now it's like I, I I like being in cash. You know, I don't I don't like when I when I've got a whole bunch of positions on, and it's like oh I, I start getting nervous then. Whereas I'm like, wow, Dave, is the market really that good? You know, are you just trading to be trading? Why do you have so many positions on? And I really kind of question everything. Whereas if I don't have anything on, it used to be just the opposite. I used to feel like. Why don't you? Why don't you? It's like now it's like, well, there's a reason why I don't. Because first of all, S&P 500 hasn't done anything since last Thanksgiving. NASDAQ's not doing so great either. And as we'll see in just one second, the Rusty is looking a little questionable. All right, here we go. Leon says, quote 16, remember this. When you are doing nothing, no speculators who feel they must trade day in and day out are laying the foundation. That's why I couldn't find it because I was looking for the word groundwork. Because in one of my books, it's called Groundwork, and then evidently it's Foundation Elsewhere. Or laying the foundation for your next venture. You will reap the benefits from their mistakes. Thank you, Leon. Yeah, because they're in there fighting it out. I mean, let's just use the Rusty as a great example here. So you've got this base that's being built because people are in there, in and out, in and out, in and out, okay? And if we continue to break down below this base – as we have so far, anyone who bought during this base 
will be tempted to get out of break even. Now, the reason I say the the length and the and the uh, the length and the time, I'm sorry, the distance and the time you stay below it increases its validity because let's say somebody's off on vacation, they bought stocks somewhere in this range, and the market does this, and it comes right back in. Well, by the time they check in, they see that that oh, okay, I'm still where I was, no big deal, okay. But if it begins to drop below this range and stays there, then eventually they take notice. And then if it gets a little further and further below it, then it becomes more and more important. And then that could be kind of the uh, the, the almost a, a physical top, if you think about it that way, to the market, like a roof to the market. So notice that we've got this big range here. And I don't have it exactly drawn properly, right? But you can see it. It's it's there, okay? And now we're below that range. Now, if we're just a week or two below it, and we come right back in, and no big deal. But the longer we stay below it, the more important it'll become. Now, the reason I wanted to show you the uh, the rusty here and the bow ties uh, is twofold. I think now is the time that we need to pay attention to see if we start getting some of these emerging trend patterns, such as the bow tie or first thrust, begin to unfold in the overall market and in individual issues. And you'll notice on a daily chart, and the other thing too is I want to flesh out what a bow tie should look like. There's a lot of confusion on that, even though it's a simple pattern. But on a daily chart here, this is a one-day chart or a daily chart, Notice that we made an all-time high here. With a bow tie, you want to trade them off of all-time highs or multi-year highs and all-time lows or multi-year lows. And you don't want to try to trade them as much in between. Now, they are what I call minor signals when they occur in between, but they're not nearly as important as when they are major signals at the highs and lows. And the reason being is, at a high, you're going to have the most amount of people trapped on the wrong side of the market when the market begins to roll over. At a low, you're going to have the most amount of people, again, on the wrong side of the market when that market begins to take off. Okay, so pay attention, pay careful attention to a bow tie after you have an all-time high or an all-time low. Now, here we had one. And then once you have the bow tie, I like to look at the low for the move. So here's your bow tie. Bow tie meaning your 10 crosses below your 20 and crosses below your 30 day moving average. You go from 10 simple less than 20 exponential less than 30 exponential to, uh, I'm sorry, this would be greater than, and then flip to flip to less than, okay? And when they do that over a short period of time, it gives the appearance of a, of a bow tie. Okay, like a little stick figure with a little bow tie. Okay. And you can see it's pretty clear right there, right after a new high. Now, first thing I like to do, the bow tie, remember, you have the, the sell-off and you wait for that pullback. And it could just be a one-bar pullback or it could be multi-bar pullback after you have the bow tie crossing. The bow tie is kind of like, uh, wait a minute, your, your trend may be changing. You may have a new trend emerging. Now, what I like to do once I get that bow tie set up, which is officially set up like right in here, is I like to look at the low for the move, and that becomes a good reference point for me. And then the high where it came from becomes the ultimate reference point. So until that high gets taken out, the top remains in place, or if everything flips back around and it goes back up, uh, obviously, then you don't have to be as concerned about the bow tie. Then it might just be chopping around in range. But you can see we had the bow tie here, and not a whole lot really materialized, and we never did take out this low. And then we had another one here, okay? Well, this one's a little bit more important because, first of all, we did take out the low, and then, of course, we haven't exceeded this high. So this is kind of uh, yeah, TJ. The question is, does it work on all time frames? You're getting a little, you're getting a little ahead of me, but that's that's a good question. Yes, the answer is yes, and then I'm going to elaborate on that on my next slide. But yeah, good question. So so far, based on this metric, a top remains in place, and the rusty. And one thing you're going to be amazed at, 
And this is why I love teaching some more. The more I teach, the more I learn. And this is the, the from a selfish standpoint, that's why I, one of the reasons I love doing these shows. And I mean, I had some epiphanies just last week when I was in the middle of the show and, said, and I got all excited about it. But one thing that I've noticed as I look at charts more and more, especially if I'm preparing presentations or speeches or whatever I'm going to do, is that I begin to see more and more things because I'm trying to see it not only for me, but uh, in a way to explain it for others. It is, it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, and that's why I love to teach so much. A, a friend of mine years ago, uh, this was before the Internet. He got me a shirt that said uh, uh, Mr. Information and a little hat that said ask me because I always seemed to be like, uh, I guess, like, what's his name? Clive Clavin, whatever the guy on uh, what movie was that uh, or TV show? Cheers or whatever, you know, because uh, my brother-in-law calls me whatever his name is, Clive or whatever. Uh, but this, the guy that got me the T-shirts in, in the hat, but the funny thing was, and this was long before Internet, anytime he had a question about something, he called me out. So he made fun of me, but that's, uh, you know, but he actually used me in that aspect because I just like a sponge. And I love I love learning things and I love telling people what I learned to the dismay of many people at cocktail parties. But anyway, before I digress too far, the thing, the point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one is that through the teaching, I've noticed that once you get your bow tie, it might not be like a like a perfect little setup where the market just sells off and it's all beautiful in textbook, but a lot of times you'll get the top and then it might chop around or whatever, but ultimately that bow tie signaled the top and you could use it as a framework to work around. Now, let's not rush out and get super duper bearish in here, but as long as that top remains in place, base is the bow tie, we need to be a little concerned in the rusty. Now, the, the point I was trying to make earlier, which I almost forgot to actually make, is by, by teaching and showing the pattern, if you go in and look at bonds, gold, oil, or at least oil stocks, all of these major tops, okay, they all had the bow tie in them. Now, we, they might have had sharp retraces afterwards, meaning that you had the high, you had the bow tie. They might have come up and had sharp retraces afterwards, but this was the ultimate high. And that gives you a framework to work around to know whether or not the market has topped or is like or is just maybe consolidating or whatever. Okay. So it's a wonderful framework to work around, not that it's always tradable, meaning that it might retrace back up for weeks or even months, okay? But just know that as long as that top is not exceeded, that sell signal, which signaled the top, is still in place. And hopefully that, that makes sense. But if it doesn't, just know that right now, so far, this remains in place. Now, the question is, does it work at all time frames? And the answer is yes. Ironically, I put a two-day one in the chart. So each one of these bars is two trading days. And notice that in the Rusty, it becomes a little bit more clearer. Notice that you have a nice little crossing over here right at that 50-day moving average. By the way, I like to watch the inflection point as it hits the 50-day moving average. If it comes in at a sharp angle like this, it tends to be a more valid signal. Now, if you look... Back in time, you might see like one up here. That's kind of what I would call a minor signal because this isn't a major, major low in here, okay? And then a lot of times by the time these, like some of these in here, you do see a few bow ties in here, but by the time they get good and triggered, the market comes right back, and you really didn't take out like the low for the move or at least not decisively. So it's a framework to work around. It's not perfect, but it can give you a good idea of what side of the market to be on. Now, uh, TJ's asking, does it work at all time frames? Yes, this is a two day chart. To those of you who see, this is, we got somebody new to the show and welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but to those who've been around to a few of these shows, they just get sick of me talking about uh, the, 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 in fact, I actually had to stop showing it for a while because I was getting tired of seeing it. But I had the, the S&P 500 chart that I showed over and over with a weekly bow tie. You had a weekly bow tie down in 2000. You had a weekly bow tie up. In 2003, and a weekly bow tie down in 2007, right about the beginning of 2008. And then, of course, you had one in 2009. The one in 2009 had a little bit of lag to it, but there were plenty enough daily bow tie signals there. 
Now, I know people who trade, or know of people, I should say, who do trade uh, patterns such as the bow tie intraday. I think all patterns are fractal, meaning that they work in a variety of time frames. I just happen to prefer the daily time frame, but absolutely, you can look at 60-minute bow ties, you can look at 5-minute bow ties, you can look at tick bow ties. And then years ago, there was uh, someone who emailed me and they were trading S&P e I, I don't recommend you do that, but this this gentleman had the gift to know what type of market he was in, whether he was in a scalping market or a trending market, and he would vary his time frame from tick charts all the way up to like 60-minute charts and trade. And I would I would encourage you not to do this, uh, but this individual did have um, a skill set to where he could kind of flip between those time frames. For me personally, if I started looking at that tick chart, I would get so caught up in every little move. Uh, I would be just be too close to the market. So that's why I resist the siren call of day trading because I think it could get you too close to the markets. The other thing is you're making too many decisions. I don't want to digress too far. But to answer your question, yes, it does work at all time frames, okay? Howard says, hey, Dave, there's only one side of the market, and that is not the bull side, the bear side, but the right side. Absolutely. And you got to be careful not to get the buy to get a bias or a permanent bias, okay? My friends who run money and their charters only allow them to be long only. I don't want to beat up on anybody because they've been incredibly successful, but they always tend to be a little bit on the bull side, no matter what's going on, okay? So, and I guess that you almost have to be because you have to. You say in some cases they actually have to buy stocks even when they don't want to when the market's going down. So I think that otherwise it'd be they'd be just be negative all the time. So, but yeah, you got to be careful not to let those things type uh, type of things to influence you. Now I've gotten quite a few questions lately about uh, what about the sector action? Okay, well you also have to factor in the market action. And then we have a good example of all three of these, setup sector market and waiting for an entry. So let's just jump right into that. This was a stock that was recently on my Landry list. My Landry list is after I call through 3,000 stocks or two to 3,000 stocks, depends on where the volatility sets up and how many stocks I will actually go through. I won't necessarily go through all 3,000 stocks in my tradable universe, but I'll go through most of those every day and by the way that's a wonderful exercise and it's fodder for another show and it's something that we did talk a lot about when i did the stock selection courses you want to get good at at looking at you want to get look at there you want to get good at reading charts then you need to look at a lot of charts you want to get good at playing the piano then you need to play the piano okay so that's the beauty of it Anyway, the Landry list is a, is what my call list for the next trading day. Now, on this particular day, this was uh, set up right here a couple days ago. And I said, you know what, guys, I'm not going to take it. It's not a bad looking setup. And, and I think I, if memory serves, I think I said you could do much worse. OK. And it did sort of work its way higher. It did sort of accelerate higher. It did have some persistency in the trend, meaning that. It tends to go up day after day after day after day, okay? And then we had a little bit of a trend knockout type of move. So even if you decided to take this setup, notice that the market began to implode and it never triggered. And by the way, that's kind of the beauty of the trend knockout, especially when you get one that looks like this, where it closes poorly. Trend knockout, for those of you who don't know, it's when you have a sharp or a nice uptrend, ideally a persistent uptrend, an accelerating uptrend, kind of like we have here. Not much going on, bam, acceleration, boom, knockout move. And you look to get in above the high. In some cases, you could actually put your stop right below the low. Well, I love it when it closed poorly because if the market gets all the way back up to that trigger point, to that entry, then the chances are that you might have a bona fide reversal in the way. But notice in this particular case, Let's say you decided to take the trade. Your entry would have been up here around 65. You would not have triggered in, and the stock implodes over the next couple of days. Now, that was a biotech stock, okay? Now, this is the current biotech stock as of this morning. 
But if you go back a couple of days, you're right around here. And if you look back at time, and you know, the net net thing is a beautiful deal. So this is like a close back in history. Let's say close, I don't know, 20 days ago, close 40 days ago, close 50 days ago, whatever, a week ago. Just vary your time frames to look back. And is the market higher, lower, or pretty much about the same on a closing basis to where it was back in time? A week back, two weeks back, four weeks back, a month back, a couple of months back. And a lot of times, just draw you a horizontal line in and see. Or you just eyeball a chart if you want. But a horizontal line really kind of wakes you up. And round numbers, you can see biotechnology based on this index, is at 22,000. And if you go all the way back to almost the beginning of the year, it was at 22,000, okay? Now, a couple of weeks ago, it looked much better because, oh, it's up here, it's making new highs, it's looking pretty good. So if you'd have seen that set up a couple of weeks ago, then yeah, maybe you should have taken it. But the point I'm making is, based on the sector action, you got to really, really like a setup to take it now this is not like i said you could do much worse than this setup it's not a bad looking setup but the beauty is it never triggered so even if you do decide you could take a setup always 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 wait for an entry and of course the third part of the equation and you should probably also look at the nasdaq and it wouldn't hurt to look at the russell 2000 especially in a case like this i look at all three every day so i don't want to I don't feel like I need a harp on one over the other, but definitely look at all of them. But of course, the first one to always look at would be the S&P 500. And if you go back a couple of days in here, you're right here. And then go back until about last Thanksgiving, which to those of you who aren't uh, from the States, that's it. usually, uh, I think it, it, it seems to always fall on a Thursday for some reason. Isn't that crazy? Uh, in November. What is it, the third Thursday of November? Um, so you can go all the way back to November. You can see this market hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress. So market's gone sideways. The sector was doing okay, but in more recent times began to weaken a little bit. Okay, So that tells you, wait a minute, biotechnology could be in trouble in here that doesn't mean you rush out and sell the farm you know but dave you you're long a biotech stock yeah and we're going to stay long that stock hopefully for a long long time and the reason we're not going to bail is because maybe this stock can continue to outperform the market as it has maybe it's just resting we have a stop in place we get stopped out we get stopped out of the gain so what yeah we'll give up some open profits but that comes with the territory you know it's like um who was it that said uh, in a presentation? Mike Moody, I think, uh, was talking about momentum. And I asked him, I said, yeah, but it always ends badly. Have you solved for that? We're talking about relative strength and momentum and all. Because momentum is a wonderful thing, but it does end badly. And don't get me wrong. I'm a huge momentum guy, but it ends badly. And, and his answer, he kind of smirked a little bit, smiled and grinned a little bit. Not smirked, but grinned. And said, well, Dave, he says, uh, you're going to have a baby, you're going to have baby poop. You know, it's like having a baby is a wonderful thing, but you're going to have some baby poop that comes to territory. So you will have that ending badly eventually. You just have to, to deal with it. I'm working on an article now for Traders Magazine where I'm talking about how you're, you're, you're broadening out that stop to transition to the longer-term player, but you're taking partial profits early on in the trade for a short-term trade and you're getting that stop up at least to break even at that point in time and the fact that you scaled out that's going to help mitigate those those big drawdowns for when that trend does eventually end badly and by the way that was another epiphany i had not that long ago i was thinking that no matter when you get into a trade or what trade you're in no matter what in the end, it's going to end badly. Who was it? George Carlin talked about the – I know I've said this quite a few times, so my apologies. You guys have been around. But when you buy a pet, it's going to end badly. You know, it's like we got a, we got a dog that's getting up in age, you know, and uh, he's becoming a little old fart, you know. And so we know eventually it's going to end badly. Well, same thing goes for a trade. In the end, it's going to end badly. You're going to have to give up some of those gains. 
So anyway, the point is that setup looked okay, but waiting for an entry in and of itself would have kept you out of trouble. Okay, that's number one. But more importantly is that you shouldn't even go after the trade when the market is looking a little iffy or sideways and the overall sector is beginning to break down, as you see here in biotech. Okay. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but if you really think you have the greatest setup since sliced bread, then by all means, take the setup. But also, as I just preached about earlier, make sure you wait for an entry. So even if you don't have all three pieces, setup, sector, and market working for you, then at least make sure you wait for an entry. And number two, make sure you pick the, the best stock. Doesn't the fact that biotech has the most naked shorted bother you? Oh, I don't. I, I didn't know that. Um, uh, you know, I think I was naked when I made that short trade a while back. Um, how do you even know that that there's naked short? Naked shorting is illegal, isn't it? So how do you how do you even know that there's naked shorting there? So, uh. I don't know. Is that that's a good thing, right? Because there's people that are shorted, they have to buy it back. Uh, I don't want to run out short. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, about shorting real quick. Go to my website and read the article Go Go Nobo. I'm a big fan of inefficient stocks. Okay, and I've done a lot of work and a lot of writing and a lot of preaching and teaching on inefficient stocks. I like that little biotech company or a little IPO. Okay or a smaller semi, or even maybe a smaller gold company, something that's going to have the potential to make a large move, especially a biotech or some sort of technology type of company where there's that promise of the future. And even better is an IPO because they can make these big inefficient moves. Once a stock gets really, really big, it's going to sort of become like the overall market. Now, they can end up being priced for perfection, and that's why if you look on other free reports, I think the banner ad is up today on the website. Just click on that and download um, the free report on GoGo Nomo. And that means that you get a GoGo -Go stock or stock that's headed higher and it begins to roll over. And ideally, you want it to be an efficient type of stock, meaning that it's big and thick and tends to, tends to trade in line with the market. And number two, ideally, you want it to be like a single dimensional company and maybe not a whole lot of pizzazz to it. Like Chipotle Grill was one of them that I recommended for that project a while back. It had absolutely imploded. That 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 uh, that put my name on the map with the uh, with the players, um, which which was very exciting for me because they're just making burritos. They're not splitting the app. It's Green Mountain Coffee is another one of those, or what is it, Craig now, whatever. Another one of those. They're splitting the bean, not the atom. So the problem with shorting a biotech is. You short the biotech and they cure Ebola or cancer or whatever the next day. Not that I won't short a, a biotech, but I'm going to be a little bit more leery of shorting something like that as opposed to something like a Chipotle or something that's coming off of high levels that's very uh, efficient. Okay, So it's kind of just the opposite. You want an inefficient stock, a stock that you think has a potential to double or triple in value on the long side. And as a general statement, on the short side, Ideally, you want a little bit more efficient stock, something that might be priced for perfection, something with a lot of analysts, because when they start turning on that stock, they're just going to all dump it at the same time, and it's going to get pretty ugly. So uh, read the uh, – thank you, Gary. Gary's just to be a link on the naked shorting. Um, naked shorting, shorting means there's no shares to back it up, which I thought was illegal. But uh, that's a good thing, okay? Yeah, Gary, I can't cut and paste from this, uh, so just uh, shoot me an email on that if you don't mind. Okay, so the point is always consider stock conditions in the back of your mind, meaning the overall stock conditions, like what the sector is doing, what the market is doing. And on top of that, make sure you pick the best and leave the rest. So pick the best and leave the rest, and make sure conditions are conducive, of course, unless you really, really, really like the setup. And this is a little soft selling here. And obviously, I have a course on how to pick the stocks. 
And these, by this is the actual spreadsheet that came out of, and you can see the whole spreadsheet on the website under stock selection course. These are the actual stocks that I picked. And that's the returns without anybody management or anything uh, along those lines. But that's with the high of the move and low of the moves afterwards. So it turned out really good. Uh, it's not always that great. You know, I probably would make a lot more money in my educational business if I told you, oh, yeah, man, it's always going to be this good. But it just so turned out that it did the course that it turned out really well. So that's kind of exciting. Um, most of the examples or nearly all the examples that I use in here come straight from a trading service and or uh it well like that one we exxon that was straight from trading service and then any of the money management and even even losing trade examples there i go talk about losses again there will be losses one of the few things i can guarantee they all come straight from the trading service so if you go to my store or trading service you can get started at a, if you're new to service you can start as a trial if you're a returning client call me up shoot me an email and say dave Throw me a bone. I'm coming back. I gave you a shot a while back. Market was choppy, or yeah, or I gave you a shot a while back. Things were great, but um, life got in the way. I couldn't trade anymore. I want to come back. I'll be happy to uh, throw you a bone on that. So just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help you out. Okay, uh, let's hop into the charts. Uh, you guys should start asking questions about stock. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the market, which I've already kind of beat to death already. But I'll talk a little bit about the market, and then I want to jump into sectors. And then we'll take a look at your stock picks and see what we can find. Um, now, you're probably going to think I'm like Mikey this week and like last week and week before. It's like he hates everything. There's just not a whole lot of great looking stocks out there right now. So be prepared for me to not be too excited. And it's not – don't take it personally. It's just what – there's just not a whole lot going on, okay? You lost sound? Let me see. Audio. I do. Yeah, sometimes what will happen is a squirrel will get his nuts uh, caught in the wires somewhere between me and you. There's a lot that has to happen for me to get the sound delivered. The good news is uh, if your sound comes back on, um, these are recording, recorded, and the local recording is very robust. I've, I've well, now I should knock on wood, but I've yet to have any problems at all with local recording. And I will put them up on YouTube. Um and as long as everybody keeps showing an interest in it, I'll keep putting them up there. All right, S&P 500. I mean, come on. I beat the dead horse on this one so far. Sideways at best in here. Um, it seems like every time this market sells off, it comes back. But every time it comes back, it sells off. So we're going to just have to keep an eye out and see if it starts making lower tops in here. Uh, let's not get too bearish as long as it stays mostly sideways. Let's not, let's not get too bearish as long as it stays at or above its 200-day moving average. Now, all you have to do is honor your stops on any existing long. We're down to two, okay, um, NVRO and CTLT. Those are the only two longs left, and we're going to just keep riding out the trend, and hopefully the trend will continue. And we get stopped out, we get stopped out. So be it. It is what it is. Again, it's going to end badly at some point. But ending badly is okay if you make a lot of money along the way. Okay? So, but as long as a piece stay at or above the 200-day moving average, unfortunately, as long as they remain mostly sideways, as you can see, you probably don't want to rush out and take a whole lot of action one way or the other. The good news is Sometimes even in a sideways market, and we'll get there in just one second, but sometimes sometimes even in a sideways market, you begin having these rolling corrections or rolling trends or rolling sector. Uh, I'm trying to think of a better name of calling it other than a rolling correction or rolling sectors. But you'll start getting sectors uh, emerge and roll over in the process. So we could see some shorts and some sectors at some point. And then maybe these energies and maybe these metals and mining and some of these other commodity-related stocks, such as gold and silver, will begin to set up, okay? So that's the P's. I think we kind of beat the dead horse in that. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart and see if it cleans it up any. Let's take a look at a bow tie on you know, a two-day, three-day. So on a three-day chart, I just hit my three key if you've got telechart. Ah. Uh, there's really not a whole lot to glean there. It's still mostly sideways. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. One thing I am beginning to notice on a weekly is we are kind of coming together in the moving averages. 
And one thing that Greg Morris, Morris taught me, and it's mathematical, it's not an opinion, it's just it's a mathematical fact. With an exponential moving average, as soon as the close closes below it, the average will turn down. And as soon as the close closes above it, the average will turn up. So what I discovered with the bow ties empirically actually does have a little mathematical uh, basis to it. But you can see as you begin to close below these moving averages, these moving averages are going to move over, a rollover, I should say. Now, the 10-day that I have in here is a 10-day simple, okay, moving average. And on a weekly chart, obviously, that becomes, what, uh, 50 days? 10 times 5, yeah, okay. Uh, I do like the simple moving averages for shorter time periods when it comes to markets. And the simple moving average will catch up fairly quickly to the price on a shorter time frame. But on a longer time frame, obviously, something like the 200-day moving average or something long like that will take a while to catch up with the, um, with the overall market. I was noodling with a 500-day moving average a while back. And that's kind of a fun thing to look at every now and then, by the way. Um, and you can see, you know, everything works better with trend. This is your 500-day moving average. And you can see the market has been above the 500-day moving average for a long, long time, ever since 2012. And before that, going back to 2009, it was nicely above it for a long time. So anyway, you get bored, play with that. Um, obviously, it's going to be really late to the party when the market, uh, when, when the trend does end, and that's where you need to be looking at your daily charts and shorter-term things. But it is kind of a cool thing to play with, uh, by the way. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ also, same sort of sideways action in here you can see on a daily basis these bow ties are coming together and it could turn it's no big surprise because we're trading below those moving averages a uh, few big updates would negate that uh, obviously that still has to happen or that would have to happen so again just kind of sideways at best draw your line draw your arrows do whatever you want but but don't get too caught up you know it seems like that ever since this market hit around pick pick whatever market you want ever since the piece hit hit 2000 and something what is it let's just see 2100 what's it where are the peas uh yeah 2000 okay let's just say 2000 you know ever since the piece hit 2000 last year or whenever they were there it began to kind of chop a little sideways everybody and their freaking brother has called the top well the market is gone almost a whole year or close enough okay and it's just going sideways, but it's like everybody's called the top. But if you bet heavily on that, you might be a hurt and pop because there have been some big rallies in between. You know, I don't know if you could hold on that long. So predict early and often, I, I, I guess. But don't make a big picture prediction as long as that market is pointing sideways. I've given up trying to outsmart the market years ago. And you're going to be shocked at how much smarter and righter you're going to be if you just, if that's a word, more right. <laughs> Uh, if you just, okay, if it's going sideways, it's going sideways. It is what it is. What is, is, unless you're Bill Clinton, and your life will get a whole lot easier. So that's a piece. NASDAQ, again, sideways. Rusty, we kind of beat to death a minute ago, but uh, we'll pull it up just real quick. Uh, again, you got falling tops in here. You kind of bow tie. Bow tie down on a daily, bow tie down on a two-day chart. So Rusty's looking kind of ugly. And that scores, that scores is a major bummer because – because the Rusty is 2,000 stocks, okay? And so it's a broad-based, smaller cap stocks. And those are stocks that I like to trade, uh, the smaller cap, more inefficient stocks, especially on the long side, obviously. Okay, let's take a look at a few sectors and then uh, keep the stock picks coming because we're getting ready to jump right into that. First of all, let's take a look at bonds. Kind of interesting in bonds. And, and let me show you that bow tie thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, notice that bonds topped out, and now the bow tie took a little while to catch up, okay? So it was a first thrust first. So always look for first thrust first before you look for bow ties. But even with the first thrust, that peak becomes the peak of the market and the top of the market, okay? Now, you did have a sharp retrace. Again, it's not always turned into a wonderful tradable thing, although you did have a nice sell-off out of that first thrust. But as long as this peak is not exceeded, okay, then that remains in place. And you can see so far bonds have sold off fairly hard. Now, we have a bow tie up. It's not off of multi-year lows. I prefer if it was off many, many year lows, like I think we had one, like back here in 2014. 
that would have been your major buy signal. This was a major buy back here, and this was a major sell back here. And anything in between is kind of in the fluff, but it's a minor signal. Now, the good news is that bonds have worked their way higher. There's this big fear of higher interest rates, and I guess that'll come back to the market. It was Greece. No, it was interest rates. Then it was Greece. Then it was interest rates. Now it's China, and it'll probably go back to interest rates. But the good news is interest rates have dropped. Bonds up, rates down. So that's been a good thing for the market. Computer hardware, also known as Apple, uh, looks like it could be in trouble in here. You got a bow tie down back here. I'm just kind of eyeballing on the fly. Speaking of Apple, let's take a look at Apple because somebody's going to ask. Uh, I think I said two weeks ago, stick a fork in Apple. The thing about Apple is it can be a tough stock to trade. It now trades a bazillion shares every day. It's part of the Dow now, okay? So it's it's becoming a very thick, tough stock to trade. And it's also a bit kind of hard to trade because it seems like it just sells off hard, then it comes right back um, because it's it's almost like a cult stock. You can't say anything bad about Apple because people are, are just loving it. But eventually, these stocks like this will get mature and people won't get as be as excited about them anymore. And then they will adhere a little bit better to regular technical analysis but you do have a gap down almost off of all-time highs you do have this big base up here you do have your moving averages that rolled over so i think it's done and someone said recently oh it's time to buy apple because every time it sells off it comes back well he might be right okay but that'll work until it don't that's not i wouldn't treat that as a trading system in and of itself but maybe he's right it, it, because it's worked for quite a while but be careful when you observe these things because many times they're an aberration. I don't want to digress too far, but a lot of times you get a trading system that works on an aberration. And I've had people email me quite often. They discover something in the markets and they start trading and they start printing money. And I'm like, okay, well, email me two years from now and let's see how you're doing. And, and so far, I haven't got that email. I did get one email from someone who, who did last much longer than two years, but eventually – it stopped working and it's like, well, you know, that's the a lesson of a hard knocks. And trust me, I've been there. I've, I've been involved with, with, uh, with consulting and see things. I've seen things work for 20 years and then, and then just stop, you know? So just keep in mind, if you're, if you've, if you've observed something, make sure it's not just an aberration. And that's where if you just boil it all down and you go back to the up arrow, down arrow, sideways arrow, you're not going to necessarily get rich overnight, which some of these little aberration things might appear, but at least it's conceptually correct. And at least you're going to be on the right side of the market or maybe even mostly out of the market, like right now while it's going sideways. Okay. But yeah, Apple looks like it's in trouble. Start drawing your arrows on that one. Uh, again, let's not rush out and buy it just because it's dropping. That could put pressure on the overall market. And then now that it's part of the indices, then it actually will definitely put pressure on the overall market. It's, it's like Greg said earlier, that becomes mathematical. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. You get areas like insurance just a few days ago, try to make it to new highs and they come right back in. You had some areas like the foods. They were coming up to make new highs. And then what happens? They come right back in. If I could find them, talk amongst yourselves. There they are. Just a few days ago. Okay. It's like they broke out and then they came right back in. And that's the thing about this market. We're just not seeing any follow through. Anywhere. Software peaked up to new highs, came back in sideways at best. OK, so go through all your sectors and ask yourself up, down or sideways. And that's a wonderful exercise. Every day I look at 239 sectors and these uh, Morningstar industry groups and I also pick up a lot of ETFs to look at just through my scans and looking through my tradable universe. And that's a wonderful thing to do. Material constructions, uh, one of the few areas at or near new highs, probably because I'm doing some remodeling on my home, <laughs> keeping all these people in business. Good Lord, anybody ever remodel a bathroom? Oh, don't do it. Uh, before I digress too far and get depressed. Uh, metals and mining, okay? Obviously, in a pretty serious downtrend, look no further than your moving averages. But shorter term, losing a little bit of steam. I wouldn't rush out and, and, and try to catch the falling knife here. But what's kind of interesting is if you take a look at gold and silver, you'll see that they've had some decent rallies off of lows, and that's gold. And let's take a look. Let me just clean the chart up. Go to a blank chart. Okay. And then let's take a look at silver. 
Now you will have some overhead supply to deal with, but on an individual stock basis, if this is 30 or 40 or 50, well, let's just say not 30, but let's say 50 or 100% away, then it might be worth taking a trade. But here you go, silver in here, nice little rally from lows. I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet, but we could see emerging trends develop, bow ties and things of that nature. Anybody remember that classic Dave Landry? On things of that nature, begin to uh, begin to show up. Um, just, again, look through your sectors. Banks are all over the place. They try to rally, make it back to new highs, and now they're beginning to implode. Again, leisure, another area, made the new highs. And, you know, maybe it's not down and out just yet, but it's already come right back in. Pullbacks are a good thing, but you want pullbacks to happen in a more sawtooth fashion. You don't want to... You don't want to pull back that looks like this right here. You want to see it just make that stair step or sawtooth higher and not come right back in. Retail, one of the few areas hanging in there, but you could begin to argue that it might be losing a little bit of momentum, but so far so good retail. So again, I can't emphasize enough. Go out, do your homework, look at all these sectors, ask yourself up, down, or sideways, or just with a little experience, it just should jump out at you. Semi's not looking too good in here. So far, downturn remains intact. Take a look at your bow ties, your moving averages there. You can see, let's take a look at like a two-day chart. There's your two-day. A little bit cleaner on a two-day chart, okay? Beautiful little bow tie right at that 50-day moving average. So I wouldn't rush out and get super bearish, but things are deteriorating a little bit. Now, one thing I've been thinking about is we might just have one last shakeout. And I'm hoping, okay, so it becomes more into wishing versus intuition, which is uh, for, stolen from uh, Market Wizards. I think Jimmy Rogers said that in there. But I'm hoping we have this one last shakeout, and then the market takes off. The shakeout enough to suck in a bunch of shorts, to get a bunch of people excited, to get those people who use these arcane counting methods or whatever, or wave counts or whatever, to say, oh, this market is topped. Uh, you know, they might they might wheel out a famous guy who does this kind of, uh, who calls a top every three weeks or whatever, or every two weeks or every day. You know, and so everybody thinks the market, like, did the world is coming, and then, bam, the market goes straight back up. So that's what I'm kind of hoping for, but I have to live in reality, right, and just believe in what I see. So at, at this particular moment, things are deteriorating. If the market goes flying straight up, then next week I'll have a different tune to say. But until this market gets out of its trading range, pick your favorite index. Uh, I'm not going to get too excited. Okay, Apple, good example, daylight example, and 280 moving average. All right, let's take a look at that, Phil. All right, let's uh, keep the stock picks coming. Oops. Okay, uh, is that a 200-day moving average? Wow, look at that. No, that's 500. Okay, let's do a 200. Uh, I thought it was kind of far away. Yeah, there you go. Uh, daylight, good daylight example, perfect, okay? Uh, Phil's pointing out that daylight, meaning that if the low is a graded moving average, you want to be long as a general statement. Don't rush out and trade this tomorrow as a system, but keep an eye on that. And when a trend begins to develop, that could work wonderfully. So now you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You've got a couple of weeks below the moving average in here. We could have a downtrend developing in Apple. Okay. But yeah, good eye on that, Phil. Uh, high five to Phil. For that you can see daylight up daylight down daylight up it's pretty uh it's a pretty cool thing what was i looking at i was looking at the 50 week moving average on like the overall market and let's just see what that is this was a, was it the 50 on a weekly basis let's put that in there and see what happens oh, which one is it yeah, and just following the direction of this, although it's got a little lag to it, this is your 50-week moving average, and this is Apple. But let's take a look at like the S&P 500. Just following that 50-week moving average, even though it's got lag to it, let me clean this chart up. I'll get rid of that 200. It's a pretty amazing thing, okay? And this is where we had a bow tie back here, we had a bow tie up here, we had a bow tie down here, and a bow tie up here. But even keeping it even simpler than that, Notice the direction of moving average turned down here, turned up here, turned down here, turned up here. You know, write that down. I just paid for your webinar, okay, which is free, by the way. <laughs> but just look at that 50-week moving average. That's a that's a um, that's a 50-day moving average on a weekly chart, and just follow the direction of that will really help you, okay. 
Tudor Jones has one rule, never trade against the 200-day moving average. You know what? Yeah. Okay. I can't argue with that. He got in a little hot water. Speaking, he said that women aren't better traders than men because they're too emotional. But uh, it turns out they actually are. It, it's funny because I wrote about it a while back in a column, and I think Montier, Montier or Galak, Galakovic. I'm, I'm horrible for reading books and not remembering who wrote what. But I think it might have been Galakovic that wrote that um, men who had their wife's input – in their trading were far more successful than the men who traded on their own. And women who had their husband's input on trades were less successful than those who traded on their own. So Tudor Jones might be wrong about that women versus men thing. And, and I think that from my observation that the ego trumps emotions when it comes to poor performance as as men we try to make things happen i mean you know it's what we do it's like the what's up you know salt and pepper push it it's what we do we have these big egos that encourage us to do these things and take more risks than we should and so i think that's more dangerous in trading than the emotions that uh, the women are prone to have more than men. Okay. When my wife wants my opinion. She gives it to me. My brother-in-law, <laughs> his name is Andy. And he'll ask you an opinion on something. And when you give him your honest opinion, he will immediately tell you you're wrong. So uh, I coined the phrase, he, he Andy's you. And uh, it's so funny. Uh, my, uh, my daughter, like, like night before last, she goes, I'm not andying you. <laughs> so we actually coined that we actually coined that phrase, which is kind of funny. You don't want me and your family. I'm uh <laughs> I'm a big pain in the ass. I'm still in some thought about closing it at break even following your plan. Oh, you're still in some? Well, no, uh you don't need to close it. No, 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 no. Okay. This is okay. This this stock was um, this stock nicked the stop a while back. Okay, if you survive a stop nick, do not play for break even. You want to play for 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000. You get the idea. Percent. Okay, you're not going to win the game by playing for break even. If you get stopped out of a stock, you get stopped out of a stock. So be it. But if you do apply, apply some discretion, then you stick with that position until you are decidedly stopped out of the position. So don't play for break even. Now, I, I could see it coming. The next thing is you, this, this stock comes back in, stops you out. You're going to send me an email. Dave, you told me not to you told me to stick with it. Well, I can't guarantee it's gonna work. If you stay with it, again, in trading, you make decisions that you live with them. Know that you still could lose money on the trade. You can still lose money on any trade. But if you are applying discretion, meaning that, okay, the stock goes down to nine bucks a share, my stop is at nine. Let me just see if it reverses right at that level. And if it does, I'm gonna stay with it. If it goes below it, then I'm gonna go go ahead and get out no questions asked rewatch not you shay but uh whoever's watching the live version recorded version of this go in and watch last week's dave landers the week in charts because we talked about that discretion to go back and watch as many of them as you could stand uh just uh to rip off a line from from greg morse just don't operate any heavy machinery after viewing okay that's one disclaimer you must know but go in and watch that, and you'll see where I talked about the discretionary techniques for staying with the trade. So if you stay with it, then you're still with it. Let it unfold. Don't worry about dead money, okay? It don't don't ever play to get out of break even. That's that's we're playing to win, okay? Gary says uh, I missed it. Please confirm. Did you say follow 50-day moving average on 10-week chart? Um, no, uh, one-week chart, weekly chart, okay? Um. Like S&P 500, 
if I can make a plot. Just plot a 50-day moving average and then plot a weekly chart, okay? I think it comes to a 250-day moving average. I did my math right. So here's a 50-day moving average on the S&P 500. I'm going to hit my 5 key. means 5 trading days. And notice that turns into a weekly chart because a weekly chart is 5 trading days. So my point was if you just follow the 50-week moving average or the 50-day moving average on a weekly chart, which becomes what? A 50-week moving average. It will really help to keep you on the right side of the market, especially if you uh, add in something like um, bow ties. Okay. All right, Michael, see you later. Thanks for coming. Yeah, Shay, when you when – you, and here's the hard part because it, it's tough. But longevity is key. You have to see any trade that you're in or will make as one of hundreds that will occur throughout your career. And you want to be around for a long, long time. Now, shorter term, especially if you're undercapitalized or under pressure or whatever the case will be, you may obsess over that individual trade too much. You may have some outside influences forcing you to do that. I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but if you, not you, Shay, but everyone here, but if you could just kind of detach yourself from that one trade and realize it's going to be one of many and do the right thing, then don't worry about that one outcome. I know, haha, good luck with that. But don't obsess or worry about that one outcome. Just realize that's going to be one of hundreds of trades you're going to make, if not thousands, throughout your career. And some are going to work, some are going to work wonderfully, some are going to work eh, on a mediocre basis, and some are going to fail miserably. So by me telling you stick with that trade, I'm just I'm not saying stick with that specific trade. I'm saying stick with this specific plan on your next trade, on your next 10 trades, on your next 100 trades. And after 100 or 200 trades, you're going to thank me, but you might not thank me <laughs> if by sticking with that with that sum. Back to you, Shay. So CCJ for Phil. Yeah, these uh, rare earths can be a lot of fun. That's a uranium stock. Um. You know, if I'm just looking over here, it looks like it's trying to take off a little bit. Let's see what the bow ties are saying just for S&Gs. Yeah, you can see the bow ties kind of coming together there. Um, but if we back the chart out a little, the first thing I see, it's a little wide and loose, okay? And then if we zoom in just a tad, we'll see that it does have some trading to overcome. So I would pass on that. What's the um, what's the other one that we either make up? We this one here. You, you are we either. Uh, no, it's not it. U R E. What's uh, U R E? Always get it mixed up. We either print money on this one or we lose our ass. <laughs> it's one of those crazy trades. Last time I think we lost our ass on U R E. All right, uh, Andre wants C P S S as a short. C P S S. Uh, well, from this long term chart. It's wide and loose and pretty sideways. It's also around five bucks a share. I know technically, um, you know, it still could go to zero, still 100%. Also, but I tend to like higher price stocks when it comes to shorting. Also, it's uh, it's very thin. I'd be very careful shorting something that only trades 200,000 shares a day. I think I would pass. I think if you see here, I don't know if we talked about, somebody talked about this one at one point. I'd much rather short it at this point here coming off of all-time highs than when it's chopping around going sideways, okay? Hi, Dave. Are your stops tighter in this current market? No. If so, how big are the stops? Thanks. Okay. No, the stops or uh, – it, it, I'm actually working that into the article I'm working on now. So uh, check back with me. I do a, an ongoing series for Traders Magazine. Uh, there's the Stops are as much as an art – as they are a science, they, you need a stop to be far enough away so it doesn't get hit on noise alone, but not so far away to where the trend has obviously failed. Now, it's a bit of a Goldilocks scenario, um, and they're not at any fixed amount. So if you go in 
somebody was asking me this morning for a list of uh, some trades to look at that worked. Uh, and so I did a little cut and paste. I was kind of fun. I cut and paste all the, the, all the winners out for the last year or so in service and gave them those to study. And uh, if anybody wants them, I'll, I'll give them to you too. Feel free to ask. And uh, what's interesting, one thing that just jumped out of me is like on some of the stocks, we had a, like a three-point stop. And on some of the stocks, we had an eight-point stop, okay? So it all depends on the price and the volatility of the stock on where the stop should be placed. And we don't have enough time to get into it today, uh, but that certainly could be uh, fodder for another show. Okay. Hey, Dr. Lee. Looks to be like gold and silver shares should be great on pullback. Your comments. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, let's. we might be a little early on that, okay? But on an individual basis, like if you go into this, uh, let's just pick on gold for a second. If we go to the sub-industry here, let me sort it by volume. Oh, five-day volume will probably work. Um, we could start seeing... Uh, some setups fairly soon. You can see they're beginning to rally off the lows. Now, I wouldn't, I think they're a little sold out to short. I mean, technically, as a trend follower, I should never say a market is too low to short or too high to buy. But if you start, look at some of these in here, now you do have some overhead supply to overcome in here, but this just gives you a good example of what's beginning to happen. You're getting, oops, you're getting a thrust from lows and a bit of a pullback, okay? So if this one didn't have overhead resistance, I probably would actually be buying the stock tomorrow, but you kind of get the idea. So yeah, Jerry, um, good, um, good eye on that. I think you're, uh, I think you're picking up on something. Not just time, but use of focused deliberate practice. Yeah. I'm not sure what the, what the other part of what you were saying, MK, but absolutely. Uh, I'm a big, uh, all right, Dennis, have a good day. I'm a big fan of deliberate practice and you just look at charts and try to get better and look at winning charts. And I know, I, I know I, I get accused of showing too many winners and not enough losers. To me, I think I do just the opposite, but I get criticized for too many winners by showing them. But, um, you know, I'm going to show every winner I make. <laughs> it's kind of like the <laughs> – it's kind of like the – can I tell this? Is it PG-13? kind of reminds me of the, um, you know, the old guy gets picked up by two women and uh, two young women, and they seduce him, and, and he goes to confession, and he's and he's telling them. He's telling the priest what happened, and uh, the priest says, you know, that's not very good behavior for a good Catholic. And the guy's like, I'm not Catholic, I'm Jewish. And he's like, well, why are you telling me? And he's like, hey, I'm telling everybody. So when I get some winners, I'm going to tell everybody. So uh, because there's a lot to learn, and that, all jokes aside, that's where the deliberate practice comes in is is studying those winners. And, and as I've often talked about, counterfeit currency detectives, they don't become good at detecting fakes by looking at a bunch of fakes. They become good at detecting fakes by looking at a bunch of good, real uh, dollars, okay? They, they study the genuine article. So study those winners. The losers will take care of themselves if you have a stop. And by the way, I always do a postmortem. Go in and look at the trade, whether it worked or whether it didn't, and ask yourself honestly, would you have taken that trade again? And that's that's all part of the deli del deliberate practice. Easy for me to say. So just constantly ask yourself, how can I become better? How can I become a better chart reader? What? How? Okay, this stock just took off. Could I have seen that pattern ahead of time? Was one of my patterns there? And sometimes you're going to say yes, and then you want to just beat yourself over the head for missing it. And other times you're like, you know what? Yeah, it took off, but there was nothing there that I trade. Now, if you keep seeing that pattern reoccur, 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 then maybe that's something you need to incorporate into your plan. And that's how I've learned to read charts over the years. I'll see something happen time and time and time again and say, well, maybe that's worth trading. Maybe that should become part of my plan. David says, are your entries more in pullbacks rather than breakouts in the sideways market? Thanks. Um, my entries, as a general statement, are always on pullbacks, okay, when that pullback begins to resume. Now, with that said, and this is that empirical thing, looking at a lot of charts, seeing a lot of things happen, I do have some breakout things uh, that I look for in IPOs. I do have – there's a little breakout characteristic. There's actually two things I'm thinking about 
in IPOs that, that I will trade a breakout or something that's more of a breakout. But as a general statement, in an established stock, I'm looking to trade either emerging trends, something like a bow tie, or established trends with something like a trend knockout. So for the most part, yes, I trade reversion to the bead in the direction of the trend, which is a fancy way of saying pullbacks, okay? Okay, uh, hello, Dave. Is the down day yesterday at TKO and VA in your system? Well, it's, it's not a big enough down day, okay? Uh, this is kind of just pullback. This is an emerging trend pattern, uh, you know, that – Breakout little pattern I talked about earlier. You could trade like your first breakouts in a relatively new issue like this. Um, I wouldn't call this so much a TKO, but it is kind of a pullback. It is kind of an emerging trend. It looks okay. You've got some bad trading back here, some fluff to get through. It's an airline. I'm not a big fan of airlines, but it looks okay. Um, as I've been saying to a lot of people with setups in this market, you could do much worse. But it's not an obvious TKO. Uh, that just kind of jumps out at me. What was the what was the mother of all TKOs? I've kind of beat the dead. Or CLDX. This is my favorite one. Is it CLDX? Uh, whenever somebody asks me to show them a TKO, usually this is the one I show them. We found one. Somebody asked me to show them one on a fly, and by accident we found one last week. Anybody remember what it was? Somewhere way back here. Was that 2013? There it is right there. It, you know, to me, this sticks out like a sore thumb. You might not be able to see it, but if we zoom in a little bit, it might be a little easier. But that's what a TKO should look like. It should be an obvious – oops, went too far. It should be an obvious type of move. Wait for it. Bam, you see it right there, okay? So stocks headed higher. Bam, that's what a TKO should look like. And ideally, you want a TKO to be in an, an accelerated trend. So notice how this market's going higher. And then it accelerated higher, bam, okay, and then it gets knocked out. Uh, you don't want to – a TKO doesn't really happen in an emerging trend, okay? Don wants to know about MU for a short. MU. Uh, it's gone sideways for too long. If you're short, stay short. But it's too sideways. Um, but, yeah, it certainly looks like it's in trouble. Usually after a huge gap like this, I'm not too excited to, to start trading a stock. Small gaps are a good thing, though. ANTH. Kind of have lightning round here. I, I ran off on and on. Yeah, we talked about this one quite a bit before. Uh, who's that, Andre? Uh, it's okay, shorter term, but longer term, it's kind of all over the place. It's got some issues, uh, gaps and everything. So, I mean, it's okay. But then the only thing I don't like now is that it's pulled back to its prior breakout levels. Notice that it broke out. And then now it's pulled back below its prior breakout. So I'd leave it alone based on that. Facebook for Don. FB. <sighs> Too many days in the pullback. But, yeah, certainly in an uptrend. Um, if you're long, stay long, absolutely. But now it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's a month. So it's, it's a month worth of sideways trading. Now, if you're long, again, stay long. Absolutely. Uh, Andre, I like that one. Earthlink, yeah. That just made it to my momentum list recently. Oops. E-L-N-K. Yeah, on a pullback, though. Uh, it's not set up at the time, at this time. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That one um, is on my momentum list that I manage. So... Fit for Phil... I don't like the little gap. I don't like the gap down it had here. Um, usually, when I see a gap down in stocks after all time highs, I mean it's an IPO. I tend to just avoid them. So this was one that we were long. Obviously, that uh, stopped out. Ogen. Ogen's at a nice trend. Ogen's actually on my list for today, or was on my list for today. Uh, but it's too. It's look at the HV. The HV is like 200. And this is why, if you're on a service, you didn't see it in the Landry list. And also, way longer term, it's got a lot of overhead supply. So, yeah, initially, this would caught my eye, but then I started picking it apart. It's pulled back below this prior little breakout in here and all. So I would, I would stay away from that one. ERI. And we're just about out of time. So 
Oh, crap. I forgot. I, I'm, my apologies. I forgot to. Uh, well, I looked at the chart you sent me on Bitcoin, and it, and it was it was all over the place. It's no longer trending, so it's sideways. But, yeah, I would do another. Um, I would do another one. Uh, do you ever cross paths with Larry Connors or Jeff Cooper? No, not anymore. Um, it's been years since uh, since I've um, been in touch with either of those guys. So they've, they've uh, since, uh, since moved on. Uh, this is just barely hitting new highs in here. It would have to accelerate higher and pull back for me to get excited. Uh, Andre, I'm sorry about the Bitcoin. I'll, uh, I'll look for your email and I'll, I'll get a chart on it. I have a way to chart it here too, but not on the fly. Um, LPCN, uh, maybe on a pullback. It's kind of crazy. Uh, it's biotech. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, let's let it pull back and see what happens. Uh, that's that's on my momentum list or in my momentum list, but um, I'd be a little nervous. It's it's kind of going up about 300% in here. It might be priced for perfection, so um, I think it'd hold off. Yeah, Andre, uh, just uh, email me and I'll uh, I'll be happy to mark up a chart on uh, Bitcoin for you. Well, look, we're right around the time where things get a little hard to get the uh, recording process. So let me go ahead and wrap things up. Um, as you can tell, I love doing these shows. Thank you guys for showing up. I'm flattered by you being here. Uh, any unanswered questions, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk again, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you, Nate. Nate says, great show. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Jerry. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. All right, you guys have a great weekend. And um, Again, just shoot me an email if you got any questions. Thank you so much.